as a nation, the British have a love affair with Spain. 12 million people a year come to worship its sun-kissed shores. In this series, I want to know what is our fascination with this country? And is there more to Spain than meets the eye? I'm amazed. I had absolutely no idea that this was here. This will be a journey of discovery for me. I did not expect this. Wow. As I crisscross the country, longing to know more about it. Seeing its world famous landmarks up close. Awesome. Awesome. This is one of the places that everyone should see before they die. I'll be uncovering lesser known sites. You do literally feel transported. <laughs> experiencing the most vibrant of cultures. Oh, oh, no. It's pretty mad, isn't it? I think it's just one of those moments I'm never going to forget the whole of my life. <laughs> There's nothing like this anywhere in the world. My journey is taking me to Western Andalusia, where Spain's most popular and most hidden corners coexist. I'll be reliving the Hollywood heydays of the Costa del Sol, discovering the sherry capital of the world, the beautiful town of Jerez, venturing south to the oldest city in Europe, Cadiz, before heading back inland to soak in the romance of Seville, one of Spain's most iconic cities. I'm beginning my adventure in the Costa del Sol, a place many of us are very fond of. It caters to such a variety of tastes and wallets. Estepona, Torremelinos, Puerto Banús, all familiar names for the British holiday maker. When I think of the Costa del Sol, I think about how built up it is. It was one of the first areas really to be colonized by the expats. Its brightest star is Marbella, a place that hardly needs an introduction. Known as an international party destination, over two and a half million tourists flock here every year to see and be seen. But if you look hard enough, you can still find a tranquil oasis here. I certainly wasn't expecting this natural beauty that I'm finding, which is really striking. There's just the sea and masses and masses of green. It's not at all what I expected, but then I am in one of the most exclusive hotels of the area. This is the Marbella Club Hotel, and it is here that the story of modern-day Marbella began. It's almost impossible to believe that as recently as 1946, Marbella was just a sleepy fishing village. Then a visionary aristocrat called Prince Alfonso bought the land. In 1954, he opened the hotel and it's been hosting Hollywood film stars and A-list celebrities ever since. I'm meeting Julian, the director here, to find out more. Good morning, Alex. How, How are, are you? you? Great to see you, Alex. Lovely to see you. Thank you Please, so much. Sit down. Can you tell me about the genesis of the hotel? How did it come about? When Prince Alfonso first opened the hotel, it was a way to meet his friends and to be with the people that he loved. It was a hobby. It wasn't intended to be a, a luxury hotel at all and, and not even really a business. Everybody that came here came by invitation, and, and that creates a special environment which we protect. Um, the spirit of the club remains. And Prince Alfonso made it like that. He was un unwillingly and organically becoming a luxury because of the exclusivity and how difficult it was to come if you were not invited. With this royal seal of approval, the hotel suddenly changed Marbella's fortune forever. 
and turned it into the playground of the rich and famous. They say in the 60s, it took you three years of waiting list to get a room in Marbella Club. All the people that has been here from Audrey Hepburn, Sean Connery, the Duke of Windsor, um, queens, princesses, uh, royalties from all around the world, everybody you can imagine. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. To what extent would you say that the development of Marbella and the development of the hotel are interlinked? If you look at how Marbella is developed, everything is developed around Marbella Club. If we are in the center of the Golden Mile, the Golden Mile is the center of Marbella and everything else is around the... Yeah. Marbella developed and became known in the world because of Marbella Club. Um, and at the same time, um, Marbella Club is linked to Marbella. One without the other don't exist. So it's a symbiotic relationship. It's completely symbiotic. Just like Marbella, the hotel has grown massively since its understated beginnings. And Julian wants to show me where it all started. Show me your own piece. Thank you. Very well. So from those first 20 rooms, how much has the hotel expanded now? Well, right now we have uh, a total of 130 units, including uh, 16 villas. And how far does the property extend? It covers uh, approximately 50,000 square meters in total. Roughly the same size as Windsor Castle. These villas have been a retreat for some of the world's most talked about celebrities. But right at the heart of the resort is its most important building. So welcome to our kids club. Thank you very much. This Looking is forward where to seeing everything it. started. This was uh, the house of Prince Alfonso. This was the doors of his villa, and the entire area that we are seeing here, which is 5,000 square meters in total, Gosh. is now the Hotel Kids Club. This is how everything starts. Prince Alfonso passed away in 2006, but there is still someone around who has lived through the heydays of the hotel. Hello, sir. Oh, how happy very, to see you. Very nice Sit to meet down you. Sit down a Thank moment. You. Thank you very much. It's I'm lovely glad to be you here. made it to Marbella. In 1957, Count Rudy was brought in to run the hotel by his cousin, Prince Alfonso, and he is the mastermind behind the hotel's enduring fame. Tell me something about what it was like in the beginning. The main idea of Prince Alfonso was always to have a smart country club. We really had the best parties, but there was never fountains of Fraven champagne. No, there was some lovely Spanish wine which the people enjoyed drinking, or sometimes just the sangria. This pool was a scene of some of the most infamous and decadent parties. From informal dinners to crazy fancy dress, Count Rudy really has seen it all. There was the Simeon of Bulgaria, the king of Bulgaria, and he dressed up as Fidel Castro. And Fidel Castro, Mr. Fidel Castro, didn't imagine that in the room was sitting, let's say, the former president or dictator of Cuba, who nearly fainted away when he saw Castro coming in. <laughs> and he looked so similar. It was so well, and they had so much good sense of humor, and that was very much the sense here. Although he stopped working here in 1983, Count Rudy still comes in every single day to check that the hotel is just the way he left it. When you arrive, you feel the atmosphere. That's what makes the Barbera Club cherish particularly those who you really fit here. Yes, you appreciate what it is that you're trying to do. But I think that's, isn't that the holy grail of any hotelier? The independent hotelier makes a hotel very much in his own image. And then the trick is to find people who enjoy the same thing as you like. You speak out of my heart. <laughs> Incredibly, all of Count Rudy's work was nearly undone in the 1990s, when corruption and scandal in the town hall came desperately close to bankrupting the entire city. But Marbella fought back and was able to maintain its status as Costa del Sol's hottest spot. I'm very, very impressed that it's managed to pull off the trick of staying relevant so many years after it was first stylish. 
Marbella and the Costa del Sol tell only one part of Andalucía's story. I'm about to discover its wild side. Well, it's a pretty good show. <laughs> I've traveled two hours west of Marbella to Costa de la Luz, in Spanish, the coast of light. And with 300 days of sunshine a year, this remote wild corner of southwest Spain lives up to its name. But despite the bright blue skies, golden sand and sapphire seas, this region remains largely undiscovered by mass tourism. This feels like the real Andalusia. The ancient town of Jerez is a great starting point. I'm walking through this charming cobbled historic center. I've never been here before, but I really like Jerez. Unlike Marbella, old Jerez feels quintessentially Spanish. It has a laid-back charm, thanks in part to Sherry, because Jerez is the Sherry capital of the world. Historically, the English have always been its biggest consumers. William Shakespeare was obsessed by it. It was so popular in the 17th and 18th centuries that many British entrepreneurs set up their own wineries in the area. Some of those Brits never left. Paula is a Spanish Brit whose family has been in the business for four generations. Over 40 years in the wine trade have taught her what a unique treasure we have in Sherry. Paula, when did the British love affair with Sherry begin? Oh, it goes back a long, long time. It was 1587, I think, Francis yeah. Drake arrived. Um, he was a... Well, a lot of these English sailors were a real pest to the Spaniards. Um, and they raided uh, the harbour at Cadiz, and they had something like 800 barrels of sherry waiting to be loaded onto the Armada ships. Um, and so Drake uh, stole them and took them back to good Queen Bess, who uh, decided that this was wonderful stuff. And what the Queen drank, of course, everybody else felt they, they should drink. English people ended up owning lots of bodegas, didn't yes. they? Yes. When was that? When did that start becoming... Well, know? really, towards the end of the 18th century, in any big scale. And the 18th and 19th centuries are really when sherry developed into what we know today. Why is it that you think that sherry fell out of fashion? Well, it fell out of fashion because it was shipped in such vast quantities. So overproduction, oversupply, uh, far too cheap, and the collapsing market. So it all went completely bust. They ripped up more than half the vineyard that was planted. And what do you think has reversed that trend? Quality. Um, we're on to, you know, a couple of generations later, um, and people have got a much more open mind. Yeah. And so they're, they're seeing sherry for what it is. It's absolutely wonderful stuff, and it's completely unique. They've been growing wine here for well over 3,000 years. No other wine in the world is, is remotely like it. Jerez, along with the towns of San Lucar and Puerto de Santa Maria, forms the Sherry Triangle. Here, all of the world's sherry is produced. And I happen to be here during the busiest time of the year. The annual grape harvest. Every September, over 21,000 acres of vineyard are buzzing, with thousands of workmen gathering grapes, which will then be crafted into fine sherry. Hola. Hi. Enrique works in one of the area's oldest wineries, and he is going to show me how things were done in times past. Voy a presentarte a los amigos míos. Okay. Vale. This is Pepin. Pepin. A machine. A machine. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> machine. <laughs> Why is he called the machine? Because he's, uh, he's strong. Strong. Encantada. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pepin is the boss of the vinager. Okay. Capataz. Okay. In Sherry is so unique that only three varieties of grape can be used to make it. Palomino, Muscatel and Pedro Jimenez. Can I try one? Yes, please. Thank you. Mmm. <laughs> Very sweet. Very delicious. Good. Delicious. 
I've tried the grapes that you make wine with before, and they are very sour. These are so sweet. Now what happens with these grapes? Machin? Machinado. Sí. <laughs> <laughs> Machinado. No, Machinado, <laughs> in Spanish. <laughs> el máquina va a coger las uvas y va a hacer mosto. Sí. Pues. Ahora a subirme arriba. The juice extracted from freshly pressed grapes is called must and is the first crucial step of winemaking. His special grape washing boots are on. This is not the way, of course, you do this in an industrial scale. They're just showing us how it was done once upon a time. It makes a pretty good show. <laughs> Surely they'd have done it barefoot. What is all this newfangled boot rubbish? Apparently, because of its likeness in colour to an egg yolk. This is the best must and is used to produce Fino and Manzanilla, the palest, driest, and highest quality sherries. Well, you can't, you kind of can't see how much juice is in there yet, although it's making a peasant squelchy sound. So it's obviously working. The grapes will then be squashed again, and the second pressing will be turned into Oloroso, a darker and richer sherry. Can you imagine if the machine had to do a million litres like this? It might take a while. Like many of us, I've always seen sherry as a fusty OAP's drink, but maybe I've been too quick to dismiss it. Vamos a probar. Sí. Eh? Primero, manzanilla. Bodegas Baron dates back to 1631, and these original oak barrels are 400 years old. What's the process of making the manzanilla? Biológico. It's a biological process. Biológico. El mosto que ha recogido Pepín y el máquina. Sí. Para hacerse manzanilla son cuatro años. The real magic of sherry making happens right here thanks to a complex aging process, the right temperature, and most importantly, centuries of knowledge. I'm very excited. It smells delicious. <laughs> I want to put some on my wrist, on my wrists, and on my ears. 15 grados. 15, 15 degrees of alcohol. 15 grados. Oh, well, things I must do for my art. Sherry is a fortified wine, which means additional alcohol has been added during fermentation, bringing the alcohol content higher than your average glass of vino. It literally smells like a summer's day to me. It's that dry. It feels quite sun bleached. I don't know how else to describe it. It's delicious. Son 400 years of history. It's gone down the ages very well. The longer the sherry sits in the cask and oxidizes, the stronger it becomes. The Amontillado I'm going to drink has just turned 50. I don't know if I've had Amontillado before, but 20 degrees is packing a certain punch. It's not quite lunchtime yet. <laughs> the day's looking up. <laughs> It smells much sweeter, but it's still very dry. <laughs> Look at that colour. It's beautiful. This is so precious that only the family drink it. There are 10 different varieties of sherry, but at this pace, I doubt I'll be able to try them all. Ahora vamos a probar el Pedro Jiménez. OK, but only a little bit. OK. Es el vino más dulce de Jerez. Oh, my God. Look at that pouring. That looks like treacle. Look how dark it is. Mm. This type of sherry is the type of sherry that you quite often get over at your granny's house just before Christmas. I mean, that's what the smell reminds me of. Mm. 
It's very sweet. My head's feeling fine. It's my legs that are struggling. <laughs> Time to eat. I'm off to San Lucar Seafront, where I've been told I can find the best food. The winery's proximity to the Atlantic gives sherry its special flavor, but it also means that locals are spoilt with the fresher seafood. Whether it's tuna, king prawns, or clams you fancy, the star ingredient remains the same. Around here, sherry isn't only drunk, it's also used in cooking. And there's a term, maridaje, which means the perfect marital pairing between an ingredient and the liquid that it's used to cook in, in this case, sherry. Gracias. Fantastic. Muchas gracias. This is prawns cooked in amontillado sherry with mushrooms. Yummy. Mm. I would have laid odds against me liking a dish that combined prawns with mushrooms. Somehow the sherry makes it all work together. There's much more to sherry than I ever imagined, and I surely won't be indulging only at Christmas. All I can say is, after today, I realise that Sir Francis Drake did have the right idea when he first sacked Cadiz and started off the British love affair with sherry. I haven't been a big sherry drinker until now, but I think that's going to change. But sherry isn't the only surprise that this area has in store for me. I don't know what I'm more impressed by, the horses or the riders. I've slept off the sherry haze and I'm ready to continue my tour. But I'm not ready to leave Jerez just yet. This part of the world is not only known for its sherry, it's also famous for its horses. Described as the noblest horse in the world, the Andalusian is an imposing animal of extraordinary beauty, elegance and poise. These horses are like no other. And the place to see these magnificent beasts is the Royal Andalusian School of Equestrian Art. This is an astonishing complex. It was bought in 1976 by the Spanish government, especially to set up this equestrian centre here. And I don't think that we have got anything to compare with it in our country. It may be an idyllic setting, but this is not an environment I feel comfortable in. I have a fear of our equine friends. I'm not the kind of person who's longing to take my turn on the back of one. Happy to admire from a distance. I definitely appreciate the skill of the rider and the beauty of the animal. They say these horses dance. What I'm about to see is exceptional, to say the least. 150,000 visitors come here every year to watch the intricate choreographies and dance steps performed by the horses. Rafael Soto, a dressage champion and Olympic medalist, is the man in charge of the show. What is particular about this breed, about the Andalusian breed? It's very old breed. It has more than 500 years history. Yes. With all the royal houses in Europe, England, France, they were very appreciated because they were horses for kings, very, with very nice action, good brain, good for the world because they were very brave yes. and uh, noble. Do you think there's a particular bond between an Andalusian man and a horse? In everywhere in the world, the people breed horses how they are. Yes, so you think that the Spanish man is particularly graceful, clever? And, and <laughs> well, I don't think brave. so, but, but brave <laughs> and, 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 and proud, you will see now performing, and it's very, very nice. So he moves with a lot of class, and the jumps he do is very natural because it, it comes from his nature. I have not often been this close to a horse before, but Raphael's calm confidence has put me at ease. I 
I am behind the scenes of the performance, and there are a lot of horses here in quite a small space. I'm amazed at how calm I'm being, but they are truly magnificent animals, and they're under such control. There's some very handsome young men. I don't know what I'm more impressed by, the horses or the riders. I can't wait to see them in action. This equestrian ballet is all put together using movements based upon a mixture of classical dressage and country-style riding. Although Andalusian horses are the stars of the show, trainers and handlers are just as important as they spot the potential from an early age. None of these heart-stopping acrobatics could be achieved without a solid bond of trust between horses and riders. It's no surprise that these animals are chosen when they are three and trained in the school for many, many years. Wow. I'm not a horsey person. Mm -hmm. I don't ride. After now, after this day, for sure. <laughs> How important is the horse to Andalusian culture? Here in Andalusia, because the land is so rich, there were always horses and breeders of horses, you know? And of course, for, for Jerez and the wine, the horses, the flamenco, it's a part of the culture. The history was very important, but it passed away because yes. there was no school. Yeah. And then he created the school for that reason. So uh, what you're especially. doing is very important work to maintain this traditional the tradition culture. of the culture of the Spanish horse and the classical dressage. Thank you. You're welcome. Riding horses might be a step too far for me, but the cleverness and docile nature of these creatures has been an eye-opener. I've enjoyed this so much more than I expected to, um, partly because of the skill and professionalism shown by the horses and the riders, of course, but mainly because it's always so inspiring to see people who really care about keeping a tradition alive. It would be a shame for this to be lost, and also for us to forget how important the horse was to the shaping of this land. I'm leaving Jerez and heading half an hour south to a little-known treasure of southern Spain, the bleached white city of Cadiz. This legendary city is criminally overlooked by tourists. The people that do come here say how reminiscent it is of Havana. In reality, it's the other way around. Three of Christopher Columbus's five trips to America started from right here. Like many explorers before, my first glimpse of Cadiz is from the sea. It's where so many ships set off for America. There was enormous trade here. And so it's a wonderful meeting point of East and West. I've never been here before. I'm very excited. This mishmash of exotic beauty comes from the blend of many civilizations. Phoenicians, Moors, Romans, and many others. Reputedly Europe's oldest city, the harbor was responsible for Cadiz's prosperity. Merchants needed to keep an eye on the sea, and every townhouse of any importance had its own watchtower. The best known is the Torre Tavira, which is where I'm meeting Belen Dorao. Hi, Belen. Hello, Alex. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to Torre Tavira. I'm very excited to be here. It's amazing. You see literally the whole city laid out beneath you. It's quite an astonishing view. Yes. 
Cadiz once had 180 watchtowers, of which 126 are still standing. Back in the 17th and 18th centuries, each SIP had its own flag so that it could be identified from the watchtowers. It is thought that an early incarnation of a stock market came from that system. As soon as a ship full of tobacco was arriving into town, people would lower the price to sell as quickly as possible. And why is this an important tower? Well, it's, it was, in the 18th century, the official watchtower of the port of Cadiz Ooh, in 1778. And you can see all around, that's the port of Cadiz, and you can even see a cruise leaving. Can you see it yes, over there? Yes, I can. Being the highest lookup point, you get to control the whole town. So that was why it was so important then, in the 18th century. And nowadays, there's not a watchman here, but we have the camera obscura that surveys and watches everything. <laughs> Belen first saw the camera obscura during a trip to Edinburgh, and in 1994, she was able to translate her vision into reality. I loved the camera obscura and, and the magic of the movement. And then I thought, well, if it works there, why not in Cadiz? And I started coming here and looking at all the watchtowers and looking at many high places in the town. And then I came up to this tower. You know, I just saw this view and I thought, the camera obscura has to be here. And it's the first camera obscura in Spain. It pretty much works like a pinhole camera. On top of the tower is a periscope containing a mirror, which reflects the outside light down into a dark room, creating a real-time projection of what is happening around us. this. So I'm now opening the mirror and letting the light come in from the outside. And the sun. There we Ooh, go. Amazing. You can touch it. Touch the sun. Touch it. Yeah, you're very lucky. And very this um, now is the um, southern part of the town. Look how pretty that is. Do you remember that ship that we yes. saw leaving? Look yeah. at it. It's over here. And what's really fascinating and what fascinated the people in the 19th century was the movement. Nowadays, we have phones and we have um, the cinema and we have the TV, but in those days, they didn't have any of that. So when they saw this, it was like, wow. I love the whooshing blowing in there. Yes. And people walking into a house. It's kind of hyper-realist. It's like magic. Yes, it's magical. Cadiz has been quite a discovery, but next I'm off to be charmed by Spain's most romantic city. I love you. <laughs> <laughs>
because before this bridge was built in 1852, yeah. we have reached a pontoon, a bridge of boats. And the poor people from Triana, that most of them didn't know even how to swim, when they tried to cross the river, many of them fell into the canal and they died. That's why they put the smallest cathedral there every time they were trying to cross to pray from the road to the Virgin to come back alive. The boat is not the only way to see the city, and as the streets are often clogged with traffic, the best way to do it is by bike. You wouldn't expect it, but Seville is a fantastic city to cycle around. There's 75 miles of cycle lanes here, and especially during siesta time, hardly another soul on the streets. Seville is the biking capital of Spain, and I have embarked on a tour to discover its most hidden gems. This city is home to the world's third largest cathedral, and religion has always played a very important role here. As a result, there are lots of convents scattered around the city center. And if you've got a sweet tooth, my first stop is right up your street. There are over 22 monasteries and convents like this one here in Seville. The nuns here supplement their income in a rather unusual manner. Many of these convents offer snacks and treats crafted behind closed doors, and I'm about to try the sweetest one. I hope I'm not interrupting prayers. Sí, hola, señor. Uh, uh, medio kilo, por favor. Sí, por favor. I've suddenly come over from Shanghai. It's an enclosed order, which means that the nuns never come face to face with anyone from the outside world. Okay, gracias, señora. Here they are. These delicacies are called yemas. This is a candied egg yolk. Never had anything like this before. I don't have a terribly sweet tooth, but it's so appealing how it arrives. Yemas are made by dipping egg yolks in sugar syrup. And the recipe is strictly guarded by the nuns. Mmm. That is very sweet. The rumor is the reason that they're so good here at San Leandro is because they use holy water to make them. After that heavenly snack, I'm ready to discover another secret which makes the city truly unique. When thinking of fashion, Spain is perhaps not the first nation that comes to mind. However, it's home to many high street and designer fashion labels such as Zara and Mango. And tucked away in Seville's narrow alleys are the pioneers of bridal fashion. Alec! Hi, Alec! Wapa! Wapa! Vittorio and Luchino are passionate advocates of Seville, and they built their world famous empire from here. Encantada. And luckily, they approve of my outfit. Entonces, hay una interpretación. Yes. De los años 50, sí. pues tienes que actuar como sí. una señora de los años 50. Oh, y tienes que moverte y de... Así, <laughs> así. Perfecto. <laughs> que moverte, así. Un poco eh, Doris Day, <laughs> Adri Herbu. <laughs> Compliments. I was. Yeah, I yeah. love a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Their timeless and extravagant creations are inspired by the strong, independent, and sensual image of the Andalusian woman. Their atelier alone is fuel for imagination. They are based in the birthplace of Diego Velázquez, one of Spain's most iconic painters. What a lovely room! It's fantastico. Thank you. Esto aquí era donde pintaba Velázquez, donde vivía, sí. porque era una casa popular en la cual eh, vivían 14 familias. Entonces hay duendes sí. y yo creo que salen los trajes tan bonitos y las joyas porque yo creo que Velázquez viene y nos ayuda a, a, ah, a, a inspirarnos. Más la luz de la ciudad, 
es una ciudad maravillosa. Sí. Ciudades bonitas hay muchas en el, en el mundo, sí. pero el secreto de Sevilla es ese duende, es algo sí. como mágico. I love what you're saying because it's so passionate. I love how excited you are about everything you do. Staying true to their roots didn't stop them from taking over the world's most prestigious catwalks from Tokyo to New York. Nosotros eh, comercialmente no hubiese sido tan interesante quedarnos en Sevilla y dijimos, nos da no. igual, mm, no. hemos ido a muchísimos sitios con nuestro trabajo, pero desde aquí. What gave Victorio y Luquino such a reputation is their pioneering contribution to the fashion world. In 1984, they launched the first ever ready-to-wear bridal collection, and it was a breakthrough, as today Spain is the second largest exporter of bridal fashion in the world. And it's all thanks to their unique surroundings. Llevamos el mundo, digamos, de flamenco, sí. pero sin, sin ser obvio. Es una forma nueva. Does look how beautiful. Una, una, una forma nueva de ver un volante. Cuando se lo pone una mujer al andar es maravilloso porque sí. crea como sí. como que está vivo. Sí. I like dresses. I wouldn't want to get married again, but there's nothing to stop me making some one of these things in a different color, is there? I love you. <laughs> Fantastic. Como le expliqué la número uno. <laughs> I feel very validated and complimented and inspired by Victoria and Luquino. They represent everything that's wonderful in the city. Passion, beauty, romance, inspiration. What a lovely way to spend your life. I have saved the best for last. My third stop is a witness of Seville's ever-evolving spirit. And if you're into unusual architecture, this will be your cup of tea. The Metropole Parasol is the world's largest wooden structure and also the biggest building to be held together by glue. It was built to provide more shade, a sought-after commodity in Seville's scorching heat. But people mostly come here to enjoy the views. I am looking out over this gorgeous city, Seville and the end of the southern part of my trip. I think this part of Spain really calls to me because it does just feel so passionate. And you see that in how passionate people are about their sherry, about the different food culture, about the way that people talk about what they're doing in their everyday lives. It's amazingly blended. It's historic past and it's fervent future. I've really fallen in love with it. Next time, I'll journey to the center of Spain. It's a city that I absolutely love. And get to the heart of the traditions, people, el flujo de Cristo me sobra. and history that this country celebrates. I'm so glad I'm getting to see it.